Hier. There we go. Okay. So, my pleasure to introduce Professor Howlett. Dr. Howlett is very well known by all of us. He's currently the Advanced Heart Failure and Transplant uh, Affinity Lead Group here at the Lebanon Cardiovascular Institute and the University of Calgary. Uh, he did his training at the University of Toronto and then went to Dalhousie University where he spent some years there organizing the Advanced Heart Failure Group. And then uh, he came to Calgary, not sure it was 2009, eight. eight. And since then has uh, been with us and has been not only a national, but an international leader in heart failure. So it's a great pleasure to have him today. Um, I will ask our friends from uh, Heart Failure to coordinate the questions because I forgot because of time schedules that I was uh, chairing the today's International Shagas Day. So I have to do some stuff for some of these societies. But anyways, it's a pleasure to have uh, Jonathan and why don't you take it from here? Thanks very much, Carlos. <laughs> it's my pleasure to, uh, to present uh, to, uh, to this group. Uh, it's uh, been a while since I've uh, been here. The last time uh, was before the uh, before the, um, uh, the pandemic, so I was standing in front of people uh, instead of uh, sitting uh, in front of a computer. Uh, those are my disclosures, as you can see. Uh, and uh, you know, I I thought about doing one of two things: either taking a lot of different presentations at the ESC and and going through each of them quickly or else doing a couple in uh, in depth. Uh, just everyone make sure you're muted if you don't mind. Um, uh, out there I can hear a little bit of background noise. Uh, ultimately though, I decided to go the second route and to go into a little bit more uh, detail. So I'm really gonna talk about three studies, mostly two, uh, two that are related and, and, then, and, then, uh, and then we'll also give some background. Uh, we're all here, and Heart Flare is, is, uh, has an affinity group. It has a large presence because it's one of the most uh, common reasons. Uh, I'm reminded uh, by many of this slide that giving birth is not considered a disease. So this is not the top five diseases. It's the top five reasons for hospital stays. Uh, and in fact, since the pandemic, uh, with masking and social distancing, actually Heart Flare is number one now. COPD has dropped by 40% and is still not recovered to the pre-pandemic level. So some really interesting learnings, uh, you know, some, even though it's a terrible pandemic. Uh, we're also reminded that we have many new therapies, but the problem of heart flare continues to march inexorably forward. Uh, this is American data. Uh, and you can see here that uh, even though we have better therapies, the case fatality rate improves, uh, we have improved uh, treatment of risk factors. We are still seeing more and more individuals with heart flare and more events as a result of that. So it's not going away anytime soon and everyone's been, uh, been touched by it. Now, one of the main problems has been the diagnosis. This is what scares a lot of people away. They don't really know if they're dealing with heart flare or not. Uh, and heart flare in one place might not be the same in another. There were different national specialties that uh, defined it differently. And so for the first time ever this year, and the Canadian Heart Flare Society was a, was a signatory to this, uh, comes the universal definition of heart flare. was published in multiple journals simultaneously. Uh, and it uh, aimed to simplify, codify the, the actual means by which the diagnosis is made. And fundamentally, you can see that there are, there are two things uh, that, are, that are required. Uh, one is evidence of congestion on the bottom. You can get that either through elevated natriuretic peptides or actually objective evidence, such as a chest X-ray or a right heart cath, for example. But on the top is where you start, and that's signs and symptoms. You can't have heart failure without signs and symptoms. And there needs to be something demonstrably wrong with the heart. 
Uh, it doesn't have to be a low ejection fraction. It could be left ventricular hypertrophy. It can be a dilated left atrium. It can be abnormal um, uh, 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 Doppler indices of uh, left ventricular filling, but it has to be something wrong. And this is a key feature to keep in mind later. It's also been uh, further codified into uh, three predominant types and then a fourth subtype. Um, we all know what heart failure with reduced ejection fraction is. That's what almost every one of these grand rounds is about because those, that's where we have therapies. We have the renamed, it used to be mid-range, now it's considered mildly reduced. It's now a recognition that ejection fraction uh, between 40 and the low 50s somewhere is not normal. It's reduced and it's mildly reduced. 50 was a convenient cutoff that everyone could agree upon. That's why it was used. We recognize that many labs will have different uh, lower rates, uh, uh, lower limits of ejection fraction. And then, of course, the ever mentioned half PEF or heart flare with preserved ejection fraction. And that's what we're going to talk about today. There's also a fourth kind, improved ejection fraction, which we will not talk about. This is, uh, but, it, but again, this is something that has been variably defined, and, and there's finally an agreement as to how we will uh, continue that. Now, we used to think that heart flare with reduced ejection fraction dominated and was the only important cause of heart flare. And we've since over the past 25 to 30 years learned that heart flare with a normal or a near normal ejection fraction occurred. And now that we've become to codify and recognize it, it's actually the more dominant finding, especially in hospitals, the minority of patients will have a low ejection fraction in the hospitals. Still a little bit of background uh, noise. Uh, if someone could mute themselves, please. Um, and so we've had a real challenge though, and we've had, we've had multiple large trials. We've had uh, some real disappointments uh, and they are not always what they seem. So what are some of those challenges? Uh, because even though you come back with a negative trial or don't have a therapy that's approved for heart failure with, with normal or near normal ejection fraction, at least you can take a lot of learnings from those trials that are, that are not quite there. We've since learned, for example, that heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is probably not one condition, it's probably uh, a variety of conditions. I remember being in an old Alberta heart study uh, room where we had this exact uh, decision, should we lump them together or should we split them apart? We originally started to lump them, later on began to split them apart. And what's coming out of this are anywhere from two, which you can see here, this is Jasper Tromp's uh, take on it a couple of years ago, uh, based primarily on uh, prop population and, and top cat data. Uh, but also, uh, uh, there are up to five different phenotypes that machine learning has been able to identify. And every group uh, is, is trying to, to, to uh, characterize these. These are two of the phenotypes that you see over and over, irrespective. You see these younger, obese, uh, inflammatory conditions. Interestingly enough, the ones on the left are the ones that tend to respond to therapies, we think. And then on the right, an older, less, uh, less uh, inflammatory, uh, more atrial fibrillation, uh, hypertensive uh, component uh, on the right, uh, and, and, and several sort of mid uh, phenotypes in between. We haven't fully characterized that, so I wouldn't take that as gospel. Uh, and, and there's still more to, but still, we still need to characterize that in a bit more detail. So that's one. What exactly are we dealing with is the first problem. Second problem is that um, with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction, cardiovascular mortality really dominates, as you can see here. On the x-axis is ejection fraction. On the y-axis is attributable risk. And, and as you can see, the, the dark cardiac death really dominates the non-cardiac death is about the same when you have low ejection fraction, but as it rises, uh, you see demographic and non-cardiovascular mortality on the right begin to uh, rise. And so reducing mortality in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, you can just see with this graph, you have a lot left to work with uh, on the right side of that graph where it's very thin, uh, whereas there's other issues like demographics and non-cardiac conditions where uh, that's where most of the death uh, comes. So a cardiac cause may not necessarily reduce non-cardiac death. And I think that's self-evident. And that's based on a lar you know, two large randomized trials. The third problem is that there's been excellent <laughs> background therapy. Uh, and, and many of these trials, you can see the color corresponds to what trial there was. 
And you'll notice that um, uh, even earlier on, a very high usage of ACE and ARB uh, and a pretty good usage of MRAs. That's not far off, really, uh, from the HEF-REF trials, uh, if, you, uh, if you are looking at it. Uh, the PURPLE, the DELIVER trial, that's a preliminary, that's an estimated, uh, that's, a, that's another HEF, HEF trial that's with a different SGLT inhibitor, and that will be reported next year. That's the only reference I'm going to make to deliver right now since uh, the results are not yet available. And of course, the result is this, uh, whether we have ARBs on the left, whether we have an ACE inhibitor in the upper right or an MRA in the bottom right, so far we failed uh, to show you know, meaningful or significant reductions in outcomes for patients in these trials. And this has ranged over a 20 year period of time. So uh, really quite disappointing uh, and, uh, and, and over and over. And the closest we've got uh, was the recently uh, published Paragon trial. This was an, an ARNI trial. Interestingly enough, unlike these trials, which were all placebo controlled, this was an active control. This was an ARB on one side and of course, sucubitril valsartan on the other side. So this was, uh, uh, didn't quite make it, came oh so close, tantalizingly close. And from this trial, we learned an awful lot uh, and, and noticed that if we had have only included people below the median ejection fraction in that trial, probably would have been a, a highly positive trial, 22% uh, reduction in the primary outcome if the ejection fraction was under 57%. So keep that in mind, keep an eye on the ejection fraction, the range, uh, keep an eye on a couple of other things that I'll bring to your attention in a few minutes. So this is getting to the EMPA preserve trial that some of you have heard about, uh, and I'd like to give you my take on that. And so let's think, will SGLT inhibitors actually work? Well, I want to, for two reasons, I wanna show you this. There's a whole host of, uh, uh, mechanistic trials. And I'm sorry for our basic science colleagues. I don't have a lot of that to show you today. It's mainly clinical today. But I want to show you this. This is invasively measured uh, PA pressure in people who were given empical flows. And these are people who all had uh, a CardioMEMS device and just published earlier this year. And notice that you're getting about a two millimeter drop, okay, compared to placebo. Uh, and keep an eye on that. PA diastolic about two, uh, the decline is about two millimeters over. That's useful for, for another study later on that I'll talk to you briefly about. Uh, and this is persistent and, and it stays out to six months. Another interesting thing is that these drugs seem to, seem to shrink hearts. Uh, all three of these trials looked at um, uh, left ventricular mass and volume as well as ejection fraction. And what you will see is that the end systolic volume drops, the end diastolic volume drops, so the heart shrinks. Even if the ejection fraction does not change significantly, the hearts are smaller, they have smaller mass, uh, and, and that may, you know, this, this gives us some pause and, and think maybe this drug will work. Of course, I'll, there's a lot of drugs that have shown this, but it's really the clinics uh, that count. And then the last issue I wanna make is, Ejection fraction, it seems like it's not just above 40 or below 40. It seems as though there's a transition phase and that really it's when the ejection fraction is normal that things uh, completely don't work. So these, these are all different graphs on the top from four trials where this investigation have been uh, made. And it is a, uh, as you can see, it's, it's a ejection fraction on the X uh, axis. And then the hazard ratio of the therapy on the Y axis. In other words, if it's below one, that means the therapy works. If it's above one, uh, it, 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 it doesn't, of course. And it's remarkable how similar these, uh, these uh, all look. They look a little bit like a hockey stick. Um, and you can see that you have reduction in the primary endpoints quite robustly up until about an ejection fraction of 45 or so. And then you start to see some attenuation in the primary endpoint where you're seeing the attenuation between 40 and 50% or even 55% is actually in the cardiovascular mortality. It begins to, to, to drop, it, it begins to drop and the uh, reduction begins to wane. And then above 55%, there's really no demonstrable benefit 
anywhere. In any of these trials, they all look uh, the same, whether it's a beta blocker, an ARB, an MRA, or Sacubitril Valsartan. So maybe there's something there, uh, and uh, maybe that exists even in SGLT. This is a pooled analysis according to ejection fraction. This the, the, they went back and got ejection fraction after the trial was done. And these, this is a, a different, this is sotagliflozin. This is a, an, a, an SGLT that's not available in Canada. And, and as you can see that uh, the event rate is high. There's a reduction in, in outcomes. Uh, you can see the sotagliflozin uh, is blue and the placebo is red. Uh, and, and, and notice that the event rates, the cardiovascular event rates, uh, it's listed there, urgent heart failure visit, heart failure hospitalization or CV death. That's the primary heart failure endpoint these days. Uh, you can see that the event rates fall all the way down to about an ejection fraction of 60. And then it looks like it begins to rise again. So there's something going on at these higher ejection fractions that we don't know, but there's some data to support the fact that maybe um, these drugs work in the higher ejection fractions, we'll have to uh, see. So that brings us to the Emperor Preserve uh, trial. Um, this is the study design. It was a placebo controlled multi-center, all the bells and whistles, uh, double blind, uh, uh, properly uh, uh, randomized trial. Uh, and it was uh, a group of patients with an ejection fraction greater than 40. So most of our PEF, PEF trials started at 45 these days. For example, Paragon and Topcat started at 45. This one starts at 40. Uh, it was designed several years ago. That's the reason. Um, and uh, keep an eye on that. So ejection fraction greater than 40%, just under 6,000 patients, randomized to one dose of empagliflozin in 10 milligrams or placebo. Uh, the composite primary endpoint was an adjudicated endpoint. Several of the secondary endpoints were also adjudicated. Uh, and it was a CV death or heart failure hospitalization. And then there's a, a whole host of secondary and, and exploratory endpoints as well that I'm not going to get into uh, today. Now, look on the left. The inclusion criteria, very important. The, the, the uh, one I want to bring your attention to is uh, you already know about the ejection fraction greater than 40 there had to be an elevated NT-proBNP. So, so something shows uh, evidence of congestion uh, that is objective. And then something wrong with the heart. Okay, that's, it wasn't, they could not have a completely normal echo. They had to have something wrong with the heart. Uh, there's a few further criteria which are, are minor and important. If you look on the right, I wanna bring your attention to the bottom line, EGFR had to be 20 or higher. So pretty, uh, pretty permissive in terms of renal dysfunction um, uh, in this uh, group of patients. They were followed along. Uh, the primary endpoint I already told you. The secondary endpoint was uh, heart failure hospitalization uh, as a totality. Usually you add about 20 to 30% uh, uh, of events when you give the recurrent uh, added to the time to first. And then there was a kidney outcome, which we don't have time to talk about today, unfortunately. So what's special about this group of patients? Well, one of the things is that we know there was an extremely high uh, likelihood. In fact, 100% of these patients had something wrong with their heart. So I wanna show you there that uh, what was the most common? It was actually an increased left atrial size, not LVH. It was an increased left atrial size, which was by far the reason that they got into this trial. About 10% of them had LVH and about 5% of them had abnormal uh, diastolic indices. Very high percentage of these patients had atrial fib or flutter. Uh, the BNPs were in keeping with other trials and so was the ejection fraction. The mean uh, ejection fraction was 54%. All right, so that's, those are two key uh, issues I want you to remember. Now let's look at ejection fraction. About a third of those patients were in the mid range, 40 to 50, two thirds are above that. So we have the 50 to 60, and we have actually a thousand patients with that dreaded ejection fraction over 60% where we don't really understand that group of patients very well. They may be special. We have a thousand of them to look at. So very important. And by now you probably heard this was a, a landmark trial. It's the first clearly positive HEF-PEF trial. Uh, it was extraordinarily well received. It's a big relief for people like me and who take care of a lot of heart flare. 
uh, where we see a 27% uh, percent, uh, uh, of the uh, secondary endpoint and the primary endpoint, which I don't show you here, I hid that slide, it's, it's a 22% uh, reduction. So highly significant, both of them. Uh, and, uh, and you can see the different components. If you look, see in the primary endpoint, it's a 21%. If you look at the hazard ratio, uh, P of 001, it's not a fragile trial, it is a robust trial. If you want to look at the events per 100 patient years, you can see that the events are rated from 8.7 to 6.9. Uh, that gives you a number needed to treat over that period of time of, of about uh, 55. Uh, both heart flare uh, uh, hospitalization first and recurrent were reduced. And then CV death, uh, not significantly reduced, uh, didn't quite meet that endpoint uh, with a 0.91 hazard ratio. Now, what happened with uh, the outcome? If you look at hospitalizations for heart flare, which is the canary in the coal mine with, uh, with this therapy, you can see that there looks to be an interaction with... Uh, ejection fraction. There's no interaction with anything else uh, ex except possibly uh, NYHA class. Uh, you see that those who had the low ejection fraction and uh, the, the mid-range and then the less than 60 seem to benefit. Those whose ejection fractions were greater than 60% did not seem to benefit. So keep that in mind. Uh, what else happened? Well, uh, let me bring your attention to the glycosylated hemoglobin. Um, hemoglobin A1C, very, very small change uh, in, uh, in a hemoglobin A1C, a statistically significant change in hematocrit. We've seen this in almost every SGLT trial, about one and a half kilograms of body weight loss, about two millimeters of blood pressure reduction, uh, just a little bit over one millimeter compared to placebo, a reduction in uric acid, and a small reduction in BNP. These are findings that have been shown in other trials. For those of you who uh, were asking, this is a smaller reduction in the BNP than we saw with the low ejection fraction patients, in case you're wondering. Um, in terms of side effects, you can see it's extraordinarily well tolerated. In fact, less serious AEs, uh, statistically significant than uh, a placebo. Uh, extremely well tolerated, like a lot of other heart failure therapies are. Uh, there was a slight excess of hypotension. There was no significant difference in complicated UTIs, although a borderline difference in uh, all UTIs, uh, very small a number of genital infections and, and hardly any uh, complicated. And then there was a small, uh, no difference in ketoacidosis. And there was uh, very, very few amputations. And for those of you who are wondering as well. So for people who have diabetes, not uh, greatly concerning um, in this group of patients. And that's similar to what we've seen in other trials as well. So if we compare this to the other trials, I showed you the graphs. This is the table. And you can see that uh, there's a, a robust reduction in our primary endpoint. Uh, and you can see compared to previously published trials, uh, it's just, uh, it made the grade. And so we're very happy for that. Now, what happened right after that was presented was a pooled analysis of both the EMPA reduced and the EMPA preserved. So if you recall, EMPA reduced, ejection fraction less than 40, EMPA preserved, ejection fraction greater than 40, so a whole range of ejection fractions. The primary endpoint in this was actually kidney dysfunction. I'm not gonna get into that, it's, it, is, it takes a bit of time to explain, I don't fully explain it. And, and remember, these were both heart failure trials, not kidney trials. So there's a, there's a lot of learnings to unpack that we'll probably need from more from the kidney trials than from the heart failure trials. But I'm gonna show you some of the changes that occurred uh, in terms of the primary endpoint and the heart failure hospitalizations. And so I'm gonna to stick to the heart failure outcomes from this pooled analysis of both trials, uh, which is nearly 10,000 patients. The first, is that the time to the first uh, primary endpoint, and the primary endpoint was the same for both trials, is very similar. You can see that 0.75 versus 0.79. The time to the first heart failure hospitalization was about the same. The time to cardiovascular death, not much different. Then remember, this trial was not powered for cardiovascular mortality, and in HEFPEF, it would be even more difficult to show that. Uh, and then if you include all hospitalizations, very similar. So very similar findings. Now, 
if you look at different levels of ejection fractions, and uh, just as they were uh, pre-specified in, into the uh, half ref, half uh, uh, mid-range and PEF, um, notice that if the ejection fraction uh, in Emperor Preserved, notice that you have, uh, we're just comparing this to the Paragon trial, which I showed you earlier. Uh, and in and, and the Paragon trial, it was blue. And in the Emperor Preserved, it's red. You can see the point estimates for a CV death and heart failure hospitalization to time to the first heart failure hospitalization. So that's part of the primary or a separately calculated total first and recurrent hospitalizations. We see the same pattern that there is, looks to be an attenuation once you get close to 50%. We're not really sure exactly where that number is. It's something in the range of 50, 55% and then you lose the benefit. And it doesn't matter what the outcome is that you're looking at. And if you pool the two trials, now we can get a better idea. And it really does look like a hockey stick where the, the, the long uh, handle is on the ground and the, and the blade is, is tipping up towards the right. You can see with lower ejection fractions until you hit about 55, you're seeing a, a, a reduction, but you're not seeing that with the higher ejection. And that may be the real limit that we're getting at here. This group might be truly different than the rest with the high ejection fraction. Now, how do these patients look? Uh, how do they compare with each other? Well, let's just take two extremes. Those whose EFs were greater than 65 on the right and those whose EFs were under 25% on the left. And you can see that there is a big difference in age. There's a big difference in, uh, in uh, sex composition. There's a significant difference in blood pressure, in BNP. Now that's partly artificial because um, in, the, in Emperor Reduced, if you recall, there was different BNP thresholds according to your ejection fraction. So I would leave the BNP out of it a little bit, um, uh, but certainly on the bottom, uh, atrial fibrillation quite different. So these groups of patients do seem to look different from each other. So that's the Emperor Preserved and the Emperor Pool trial. I thought I would show them together. And then I would follow this up with another, uh, uh, another, another study that was actually shown during the Heart Fair Society of America meeting just a couple of weeks ago, because it's, again, it's another uh, uh, preserved ejection fraction. So this is Mikhail Kozaborod. Um, he has published a lot on daplical flows in mechanistic trials, and this is called Preserved HF. It was a very small trial, only 324 patients. And this was a mechanistic trial and its primary endpoint was not six minute walk test. It was actually change in quality of life score. So remember quality of life scores can go from zero to a hundred. Uh, and uh, you know, typically a class two heart flare will have high sixties uh, in their That's what their score will be uh, lower than that high sixties, low seventies. And then there are a bunch of secondary endpoints. I just wanted to show you a couple of things. So, this is a, only a three-month trial. It's basically what happens to a patient. And I'm showing you this so that you can get a sense for what your patient might get. Notice the KCCQ score is low 60s here. So most of these patients were in functional class three. They're not as well off as, as uh, you know, there's a trial I was involved with uh, published last year where the baseline KCCQ score was, was higher than this. And you didn't see as much of a change. Here we're getting into a class three, and this is an average difference of 5.8. That's actually huge. It's more than double what you would expect to see for many other uh, therapies, such as um, uh, uh, such as uh, sacubitril valsartan, for example, over and above a, um, and it's even higher than what you would get with an MRA. So keep that in mind. That's a big change. And if you put this into a uh, context for your patients, a score change of five or more in the KCCQ is thought to be clinically significant. In other words, you go into the room, you talk to your patient, and you quickly realize that they feel better. They, they feel better and they look better. That correlates quite nicely with a five-point change. Uh, for comparison, a 10-point change uh, is, is, is massive. That's, that's like a functional class change. And a 20-point change is not unlike uh, a change that you would get with having an appendectomy for acute appendicitis. So just so you know what, five points is actually quite a bit. 
And notice here that if you look at the overall group of patients, for every nine patients that got the therapy here instead of placebo, there was one more that had a significant uh, uh, either failed to worsen or uh, improve significantly in, in uh, quality of life. So pretty significant. Um, I already and, this, and then here, this, this was a big surprise, a 20 minute, uh, a 20 meter difference in uh, six minute walk. Other treatments so far have failed to show a difference in six minute walk. So don't really understand why this one happened. My guess is because they were quite congested and quite sick when they started the trial, because again, 250, 240, that's a pretty, that's a pretty significantly low um, uh, six minute walk. So these people were quite disabled when they were, were enrolled into the trial. Maybe that's the reason, uh, but that's a big change. That's about, uh, so for pulmonary hypertension trials, you'll get about 30 to 40 meters for, for the vasodilators, just to give you an idea, 30 meters is kind of typical that you would get there. So this is a, a, a schematic that I put together that would indicate what SGLT therapy might be. So we have HEFREF on the green, we have HEF mid-range uh, EF in the middle. And uh, on the top, you can see the approximate numbers of Canadians with, the, with these therapies. And, uh, and, then, uh, and then you can see uh, on the right, not so sure once, once you get well over 50, but certainly up to 50%, and then maybe up to 55%, we'll have to see exactly where that's gonna land. I would suggest if the echo has a norm, abnormal ejection fraction, that's where uh, you, would, you, you would draw the line. That's, at least that's where I would as well. So that's uh, heart flare with preserved ejection fraction. Now I'm gonna spend the next few minutes talking about a completely different therapy. This is implantable uh, uh, therapy. This is a cardio MEMS device. This was the guide HF trial. It's the second uh, moderately sized trial to come from this group. Uh, the first was the champion trial. Uh, it's been a, we've been using it here. Brian Clark, when he was here, was really champion and advocating for this and led the trial here. Uh, and uh, the, the, the findings were, were actually presented in the same session as the uh, EMPA Preserve trial. So the first and foremost is people uh, uh, have always thought, well, you're, you're sick for three or four days before you develop heart flare and hospitalization, but it, it turns out that this actually occurs approximately two to three weeks before, not the day before. The first thing to happen is actually uh, the uh, pressures go up, then the heart rate variability changes, then the BNP changes, uh, and then uh, you can see uh, other findings uh, associated with congestion. And the last thing to happen is actually um, the symptoms. So it's a little bit like an exercise test for ischemic heart disease, where the last thing to happen is the chest pain. The first thing to happen is, you know, ATP becomes depleted uh, in, in an ischemic uh, muscle. So think of it that way. And the, the PA pressure, the PA diastolic or the left atrial pressure is kind of the same as an ATP depletion, if you will. Uh, and so we've known this for a long time. So I, the idea is trying to translate this into technology that allows us to know what the pressure is in order for us to intervene. And that's the whole idea. So this is a piezoelectric crystal uh, that has uh, little um, uh, titanium wings uh, made out of the same material as an ASD closure device. And uh, they go into a pulmonary artery. Uh, they, they sort of hold against the edges like a butterfly. And it uh, resonates depending on what the pressure is in the pulmonary artery. You send a radio frequency signal by laying on a special pillow with a radio frequency device, not unlike you know, the wand that you would use for a pacemaker. And uh, you send the energy. So a person has this in their home, they lie down on their pillow, they uh, turn it on and it sends wirelessly the data uh, to, the, to the wand and then to the central station. And it tells you what the pressure is on the right. So this could be done once a day and you can act accordingly. So the first trial, which looked only at class three patients was published about 10 years ago. Uh, and this led to approval of, of the device because of the reduction in events. But there were some issues with the trial. The blinding wasn't perfect. And a lot of people thought, well, they got better treatment because uh, they, had, um, they had the device in there and they had more frequent contact and maybe that's why they had better outcomes. And so a second trial, the Guide HF trial, uh, was, uh, was put together. And this was to answer two questions. One, if we used more robust blinding uh, 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 mechanisms. And, uh, you know, I was part of this trial. I was one of the uh, blinded uh, uh, assessors. Uh, great care was taken. 
uh, such that people who were blinded weren't even supposed to see the chest x-ray. They were supposed to get, uh, because you can tell that the device is there, of course, uh, and they were asked to get their information from people who, who uh, you know, could see the chest x-ray but weren't part of the study. Uh, the second thing is, uh, and apart from the expanded uh, blinding, is that ambulatory class four heart failure as well as class two heart failure patients were included. And the third difference is that patients in this trial were followed for 12 months. So unlike many other large randomized trials where patients are followed until either the trial ends or uh, they have enough events, here, everyone was followed for 12 months and then they were done. Uh, so keep that in mind. This is very important for how we interpret this trial. Thousand patients, the primary endpoint was heart failure hospitalizations, urgent heart failure visits where they had to get an IV therapy uh, or all cause mortality at 12 months. And then a bunch of secondary endpoints, including KCCQ, again, our quality of life, a Euroqual or European quality of life, and then a six minute walk test. So this is what happened. Uh, it wasn't a simple trial because at an average of nine months, uh, uh, of uh, study into the study. So the, the median, the patient, patients in this trial were in the trial, in this trial, a median of nine months when COVID hit and the national emergency was declared. And as you can see, we, we all know that this tremendously changed uh, behavior and you, you'll see that there were some real changes that occurred in this trial as a result uh, here. So most of our patients were, were, fully enrolled. In fact, all the patients were fully enrolled. And in fact, most of them had had substantial follow-up first. And if you want to look at it this way, about three quarters of all of the endpoints happened before the COVID emergency, and about one quarter of the events occurred after uh, COVID. And of course, patients weren't followed for long enough to know what happened after, uh, especially after the second wave. So it's hard to know what would have happened on the other side of that uh, which is what we're seeing in 2021, where we're now seeing recovery of the heart failure events. In this group of patients, uh, you can see that uh, most of the patients uh, were enrolled because of an elevated BNP. Uh, some of them, about 20% of them, because of a heart failure uh, hospitalization and a BNP. Uh, and uh, there was no difference between the two groups. You can see that most of them uh, were in class three, about two thirds of them were in class three, and a few were in class four. So there's two slides here that were shown during the, during the session. On the left, you see the overall, and this is the official formal outcome on the left. The overall analysis shows a non-significant 12% reduction in the overall, driven almost in, uh, solely by hospitalization on the left. Now, if they had to stop the trial when the, the COVID emergency was uh, declared, it would have been a positive trial. I, I it, it, you see the p-value, it's 0.049, it's not robust, but it would have been technically a positive trial with a 20%, just under a 20% reduction in outcomes and something very different here. And you see, notice that the, the curves have a different shape at the end of the follow-up. If you just look at heart failure hospitalizations and the overall analysis, again, it, it just doesn't meet uh, the p-value threshold for what we call positivity. If you're a Bayesian, you would say this is still a positive trial, but uh, that's not how it was designed. Uh, and it was highly significant, uh, almost a 30% reduction in hospitalizations before COVID-19. Uh, and then uh, if you look at the primary components, you can see that there, uh, that there was really no difference in mortality at all. It was all driven by hospitalizations. So uh, on the top, you have overall and on the bottom, you have the pre-COVID-19 impact. So pre-COVID-19 positive for hospitalizations, afterwards not. In terms of subgroups, the only difference was functional class four where we see a worse outcome. That's actually been shown before with hemodynamic monitoring where it clearly doesn't reduce outcomes in patients who are uh, at the end stage of their uh, condition but no interaction with ejection fraction. You have to remember that about 50% of these patients had HEF-PEF or an EF over 40 uh, in this trial. So technically HEF mid-range or HEF-PEF uh, and a large proportion of females as well. 
The secondary endpoints, I'll keep it brief for you, really no significant difference in to, except for the heart failure events, which you can see in the upper left, but, uh, uh, but really not a, not a large difference in uh, the KCCQ, uh, uh, you know, especially when you consider the overall uh, outcomes. So later on in the meeting, uh, there were some comments about, well, what exactly was going on? And you'll be interested in seeing some of these things. So I thought it would add them in. So this is during COVID-19. This is what happened during COVID-19. This isn't pre, like I showed you before. This is only during COVID. So this is during the 24% of events that occurred or 26% of events that occurred uh, afterwards. Notice, very close together, uh, no difference at all. Hazard ratio of 1.1. Hospitalizations, same thing, no difference at all, not close. So really identical outcomes during COVID-19 af after the COVID emergency was, uh, was declared. Ignore the right side of the curves, very few events in the right side of the curves. Um, and if you look at uh, the uh, primary endpoint analysis, uh, you can see that the event rates change. So the, the per month rate is per month per patient, sorry, uh, per patient per year, my apologies, per patient per year, not per month, um, is about 0.55. This is true for many other monitoring trials, anywhere between 0.5 and 0.6 is what you'll see. The control was quite a bit higher. This is a sick patient population. But then what happened with COVID, everyone stayed home. And of course, we saw this in Canada as well, where there was a much lower event. We were wondering, where are all the heart player patients? And that's exactly what happened uh, here. The hospitalizations fell in the control group. And so the hazard ratios, really something changed. The, COVID-19 had a profound effect on the event rates. It did not have a, a profound uh, change in the number of contacts because almost all of these contacts were phone contacts, not face-to-face -face contacts. There was only a six month and a 12 month face-to-face -face contact. Uh, so this was not a typical trial where a patient came in once a month. It was, uh, it was really mostly uh, that occurred by phone and not much different. You wouldn't expect it to be. Uh, in terms of the monthly changes in medications, you can see the effect of COVID-19. Uh, you can see in the blue, in the treatment arm, that there was a big change, uh, the number of changes per month in medications. And you always see more changes per month. About two thirds to three quarters of changes tend to be increasing drugs, especially diuretics. But about a quarter to a third of changes are actually decreasing drugs, especially diuretics as well. So it goes both ways, up and down. And as you can see, there was a lower event rate in, in those uh, uh, who had the control, as you would expect, no change during COVID-19. But there was a big reduction in changes. And we don't know the reasons for this. We don't know if it's because changes weren't recommended uh, or if it's because changes couldn't be recommended because people uh, couldn't get blood work. That was not collected uh, during the study. So it'll take a little bit of looking to figure that out. And then trending uh, PA pressures, you can see uh, on, the, on the graph that there's a lower PA pressure uh, uh, in the control during, uh, during COVID-19. And the pressure compliance was about the same. So it, 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 it did change, but by only by a small amount during COVID-19. About a 4% difference. And then PA pressures. Remember I, I told you to remember the two millimeter difference? Well, overall, you see that there's a mean difference of, a, of less than a millimeter mercury in, uh, in uh, pressure uh, overall. But prior to COVID-19, it, it was a difference of, of just about two uh, millimeters of mercury, whereas in COVID-19, they were completely the same as you would expect um, uh, from, the, uh, from the outcome. So some issues, one. Uh, there's a lot to understand and unpack about this trial. We'll have to stay tuned. But half of these patients had HFPEF. They behaved the same as those with low ejection fraction. Uh, fluid is fluid. About half of the patients were in the target range. That is, their pressures were already okay. The target range, as you can see here, are listed. The PA systolic, the PA mean, and the PA diastolic are listed there. Uh, and there's only about a two millimeter difference. 
about 44 were lost to follow up in the usual care and 25. So there's a, in, in, in studies like this, where you already have a major behavioral change, and then you have a difference in follow up, that's always a concern. Uh, but overall, uh, it confirms the link between pre existing congestion. Uh, and uh, there's behavioral studies. Uh, this is a behavioral study, because we saw a result and an action had to be taken. It's not like uh, you either take the medication or you don't and then see what happens. Now, this is uh, an intervention that will cause people to make decisions. That's quite a different uh, intervention. And uh, we had COVID come into this and it clearly had an effect on the trial. You can argue what the effect was, but certainly there was an effect. So we have a really positive trial. Thank God for that. We've been waiting the longest time. Uh, and we have SGLT inhibitors now, I think with, it's pretty clear that we'll have an expanded indication for those. The questions that remained are at the upper reaches of ejection fraction. The DELIVER trial, which has over 5,000 patients, uh, will be presented next year. It is a dapagliflozin with ejection fraction uh, over 40 next year. Uh, and, uh, and, and it looks to me like fluid is fluid. Uh, we saw evidence of decongestion in, in uh, the, the uh, SGLT trials. We've seen it in the mechanistic studies. Uh, we saw that in, to a certain extent in the guide, guide HF trial. And so there's still a role for those going forward, but a little bit more to unpack and learn uh, where the sweet spot is uh, in, in, uh, in implantable hemodynamic monitoring. I do think it's here to stay, uh, but we'll see. So uh, I'll stop there. Uh, and uh, if there's any questions, I will try to take them in the remaining uh, 10 to 15 minutes that we have left here. Hi, Jonathan, it's Nicole. Uh, Carlos had to step off, but there are some questions that uh, I will ask you and maybe add part B of my own questions. But the first question uh, is uh, from Vikas, and he would like to know uh, if Paradigm had not used, or sorry, had used Valsartan, but Paragon uh, used it as a comparator, if you had gone back using an Alipro, would you have got a different result? Would you have used, could we have used it for a different indication? Could the p-value have been more uh, robust? And then the second part is, if you believe so, then um, do you think there'll be, I think the FDA released some recent statement about the use of Valsartan and diastolic heart failure. Are you going to start to see it used more often? Yeah. So, I mean, good question, uh, Vikas. So I can tell you that I, I do think that the use of Valsartan uh, would have had an identical impact as uh, an ACE inhibitor. Um, and I say that because uh, if you recall, there was a trial called Valiant uh, many years ago. It wasn't an Alipril, it was Captopril, but Captopril is the gold standard post-MI uh, high-risk ACE inhibitor that's been used in, in, in the, the SAVE trial, for example. And, and it was a full dose TID, 50 TID of, of uh, Captopril that was tested against Valsartan. In the, uh, in the Valiant trial, it was a post-MI, high-risk heart failure group, uh, 15,000 patients, and the hazard ratio was 1.0. No difference at all between those. So I do believe that Valsartan would have the same event rate as an ACE inhibitor. Uh, and so uh, I think it would not have changed uh, our, our findings at all. Uh, anything that we saw that would be different, I would have, I would have attributed to chance. Um, the results of Paragon are very interesting. The, the uh, Europeans are just looking at that now. The Americans, says, as many of you know, if you watch it, they have actually approved it uh, for ejection fraction 40 to 50. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, that's based on some of this, the data that I showed you before, um, before the preserved HF trial, so, uh, or EMPA preserved trial. So uh, I, I think that we'll see some of that. And I think that we're probably gonna see some off-label in Canada. I do know that, that it's before Health Canada, not sure what's going to happen because uh, I find Health Canada, and some of you on the call here, you have experience with Health Canada. I find them a little bit unpredictable uh, as to what they're going to do. So uh, I, I'm not so comfortable guessing what they would want to do, but I'm hoping that they would follow the American lead in that. No, excellent answer. Uh, next question. Uh, Russell Quinn wants to use your own words against you, but in, in essence, he said, you quoted fluid is fluid. Uh, excellent talk. Can you convince me that an SGLT2 inhibitor is nothing more than a very expensive diuretic, uh, given the main impact is really just on heart, heart failure hospitalization? 
no, uh, I'm not going to try to convince you of that. Uh, sorry, Russell. Um, the the uh, No one knows the mechanism by which this works. In fact, there's been some really great work. I think one of our PhDs, didn't they win this, this the Canadian Journal of Cardiology Award for best article or something? I think I saw that. Um, it worked on uh, interstitial and, and uh, I think his work was... Uh, showing a uh, reduction in fibroblast uh, activation in the, in, in the matrix, extracellular matrix, uh, when exposed to ampagliflozin. There's, uh, there's uh, out there, there are many thoughts as to why this works. I personally feel that this drug is a, has a renal uh, effect that's very, very impressive. Uh, these drugs are equal, as, as powerful as they are for heart failure, they're equally powerful for protection of renal events. Uh, and so I think it's a, I think it's a renal drug that has secondary effects on, on, the, uh, on the neurohormonal system uh, uh, and that perhaps uh, uh, turgor, uh, cell turgor is, is altered, but I'm guessing just like uh, other famous people are, uh, and there's a, there's a lot of different mechanistic studies ongoing. Some people think it's hemoconcentration, uh, hematopoietic in, in, inhibitive factor, it, it inhibits that. Um, and it uh, reduces uric acid. It, uh, uh, there's, there's a couple of studies that suggest it changes ejection fraction, myocardial energetics. There's a whole bunch of things that we could talk all day about, but I'm not going to try to convince you that because I don't know. Uh, there is, I know we're running out of time, so I'll just ask you two quick questions um, just because there are other, some other specific questions that we can, I can send to you offline and you can get back to per certain people. One was your personal use of Entresto in mid-range ejection fraction, or I'll even add uh, preserve or uh, uh, improved ejection fraction. So those with reduced that are now back up into the mid-range or maybe into that diastolic range. And then the second was, what would be your perfect phenotype to refer someone for cardio man? This for those people who don't refer so that they know when to contact us or to consider a device such as cardio mems, which you've just talked about. Yeah. So mid range, well, it's all about getting access to the drug. So um, the first is if the ejection fraction is between 40 and 50, I do think the irony is it provides significant benefit. Uh, it's data, you know, why would you use an ACE or a beta block, uh, ACE or an, R, uh, ACE or an ARB, in EF 40 to 50, uh, with the evidence that we have, when, where, where it, you know, I'm, I'm pretty confident that uh, most, most people would say that the evidence from uh, Paragon would be superior in that ejection fraction range up to about 50 or say if it's, uh, if it's reduced, if it's a reduced ejection fraction, anything that's not normal. It's a really about access to the, to the drug. So you can, you can access the drug by having patients pay for it. Some of them will and can, and I've had that. Um, I've had patients uh, have it covered on their private insurance. And so, you know, like so many things, it never hurts to ask because sometimes they'll say, yes, it's amazing. Uh, and, uh, uh, but getting Blue Cross coverage routinely for patients 40 to 50, um, sometimes, you know, if the ejection fraction is around 40 and you think, I get, you know, someone who's better at echo than I am, like, like Kristen, for example. And I'd say, Kristen, do you think that's 39 or 41? And she'll look at me and she'll say, I think it might be 39. Um, and so if that's the case, then you're, you're, you're fine to get uh, Blue Cross coverage. But of course, uh, I would never encourage anyone to tell an untruth or document anything that's not correct. Uh, by and large, most of my patients with 40 to 50 don't get an Arnie. But if there's a chance, then I will, because I think it is the best drug for them. Uh, the second question I can't remember now, Nicole. Oh, uh, because of these newer technologies that we're using for remote, like, you know, people wearing Apple watches and, uh, you know, we're, we're getting all this remote information. And so with the cardio mems, the implantation to monitor PA oh, pressure. Yeah. So what would be the perfect phenotype? Like when, it, what is a yeah. general cardiologist going to be like, Hey, I need to call Jonathan and get this guy. Cause you know, is it, it readmissions? Is it a type of phenotype? But like, what is your phenotype yeah. that you use? Yeah. Okay. So now, yeah, sorry about that. So here's what I, I think there's two groups. Uh, I think it's the two, the functional class two, three patients. So the mild to moderate heart failure patients, um, number one, and number two, uh, people where, where they, they are doing well, they're variable and well, uh, but you don't really know what their volume status is and they, and they have events. So they're not functional class four. 
they're not uh, they're not uh, functional class one, but they get into trouble every once in a while, um, both due to uh, low or high filling pressures. They'll tend to have uh, you know a, a, a moderate degree of renal dysfunction. Uh, that's that's the group that I think hits the sweet spot. Persistently congested patients. Um, I don't think you need a hemodynamic monitoring to know that you should try to keep them as dry as you can possibly get rid of, but they just continue to have their events no matter what you're doing. And functional class one patients have a low enough heart flare hospitalization rate that I, I think it would be too difficult to show an improvement. So it's that two to three uh, people that you don't know what their volume is, and then those who have those intermittent uh, decompensations, Th those are the ones that I would look for. Okay, and then uh, well, this is more of a comment, but uh, Carlos rejoined us and said, uh, great talk in a few years, we can present par parachute HF and uh, hopefully determine whether Entresto is superior to enalapril and Shanga's uh, cardiomyopathy. But I'm not sure if you have a comment, but that is probably the end of our question period, if not. Uh, I would say, Carlos, hopefully it won't be that long. As I understand it, the event rates in Chagas are pretty high. So I'm kind of hoping that it won't take very long to get the, re the, the, the result. But you might want to comment on that. And I've made some comments about uh, cardiomyopathy, and, and there's there's a few heart failure people on the line. They may wish to, to chime in as well. Um, I'll give everyone a minute yeah. or two. We're going to get some data on parachute uh, soon. Uh, it's aiming to randomize about uh, 1,200 patients in five countries in, in South America. So hopefully we should finish enrollment. Some, well, COVID has put a little bit of a halt on everything, but uh, we expect to finish enrollment by the end of next year. And it's 24 months of follow-up. So still some time to go there. But yeah, you're right. You know, the, the event rate in Chagas cardiomyopathy is like uh, almost triple the event yeah. rate in non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. Yeah. So we're going to have tons of events that are usually heart failure, incident cardiac death. You saw that in benefit trial also. So we'll see. Yeah. Uh, with two minutes left, uh, I don't have any further questions. Any last comments, Jonathan? Otherwise, give everyone no. back a few minutes. No, the, no, give you guys uh, your two minutes back to your lives. And uh, thanks for listening. Uh, love to hear the feedback, anything that we could do better. And uh, look forward to the next time. Thanks. Take care. Go ahead.